Is it true that your dad was the heir to the Baskin Robbins ice cream empire and that he walked away from it completely and all the money from it in order to pursue his own path? Um, do you think he regrets that decision? And do you regret that he made that decision? My grandfather founded the Baskin Robbins ice cream company, 31 Flavors. My dad, John, grew up with an ice cream cone shaped swimming pool in the backyard and 31 flavors of ice cream in the freezer. He was groomed from his early childhood to one day join in running the family company. But when he was in his early 20s, he was offered that chance and he said no. And he walked away from a path that was practically paved with gold and ice cream to, as we jokingly say in our family, follow his own rocky road. He ended up moving with my mom to a little island off the coast of Canada. They built this one-room log cabin. They grew most of their own food. They practiced yoga and meditation for several hours a day. And they named their kid Ocean. That's me. They almost named me Kale. But I have to tell you, I'm glad they took the conservative route when they named their son. But we did eat a lot of kale, along with cabbage and carrots and onions and broccoli and other veggies we grew in the garden. Then as my dad got a little uh, older in life, he ended up writing a book called Diet for a New America and becoming one of the leading spokespeople in the world for healthy food for everybody. And millions of people were inspired by his message. And the media called him the rebel without a cone. Here he was. He'd walked away from this ice cream empire to follow his own path and become a spokesperson for health. Uh, so I've been really inspired by my dad's example, and I think he's never looked back with any regret on his choice. It was a choice for integrity. It was a choice for conscience. And it happens to be a choice that's enabled him to help a lot more people than he ever could have helped if he'd focused his life on building or inventing a 30-second flavor. And now here I am, author of 31 Day Food Revolution, and I'm saying that 31 Steps to Health can bring you more pleasure and more satisfaction even than 31 flavors of ice cream. And I believe that I'm carrying my grandfather's legacy forward by bringing joy and happiness to people, by giving people options for every day of the month, and also uh, I'm taking it to the next level by moving from ice cream to health. And my dad has been such a pioneer in that, and I am so grateful to work with him. People ask if I'm following in his footsteps, and I say, no, we're leading the charge together. And I'm so grateful to have his partnership in that. Is your grandfather still alive? My grandfather ended up being one of the people who was inspired by my dad's work. He, he had lost his brother-in-law and business partner, Bert Baskin, at the age of 54. And my grandpa, at the age of 71, was kind of on death's door facing serious heart problems, type 2 diabetes, weight issues, and his doctors told him he didn't have long to live. He'd always eaten the standard American diet plus a double scoop of ice cream on top, and now he was facing the standard American diseases. Um, but his doctors gave him a copy of my dad's book, Diet for New America, and suggested he read it. And amazingly, my grandpa did, and he followed its advice. So he cut way down on sugar. He actually pretty much stopped eating sugar. He gave up ice cream. He stopped eating most animal products, and he started eating a lot more whole plant foods. And he got results, the kind of results that are fairly typical and predictable for people who make these kinds of changes. He uh, got off all of these medications that he was taking. He reversed his diabetes and heart disease symptoms. His golf game improved seven strokes. He lost a lot of excess weight. He felt way better. He lived another 20 more healthy years. When he was in his early 90s, my dad and I were with him on his deathbed. And my grandpa said, you know, said to my dad, when you left Baskin Robbins, I thought you were crazy. And I might have been right, he said. But thank God, some of us have lived long enough to learn a few new things. And then he looked at both of us and he said, I'm so proud of you because you're helping people. And that really matters. And, you know, he's such an inspiration to me because, you know, he, he had a lot of investment in thinking there was no connection between food and health. And he had the courage to make a change. And if he could make that change, then I think there's hope for the rest of us, too. What is wrong with eating animals if they're raised by so-called humane standards? I'm never one to place value judgments and use words like right and wrong when it comes to human choices. Um, but I think that my concern about humane meat, for example, is there's, there's a few of them. One is it's often greenwashing, that the industry will tout something as humane and it may just be a little bit less bad. Uh, they, just because they put happy animals on the package doesn't mean the animals are happy. So you really may want to check out the operation if you're seriously thinking about it. Um, but, you know, if you have a neighbor with chickens and they're running around out there, like, that's its own thing, you know. Make your own choices about that. But recognize that a lot of what's out there is marketing hype. 
uh, and not necessarily having a lot of substance behind it. Um, the other problem is there are environmental concerns with animal products. And just because an animal lives in a good way doesn't mean it doesn't uh, waste a lot of resources to cycle biomass through it instead of eating it directly. Um, but there are ecosystems where that can make sense, where grass grows and you couldn't grow cropland. And cows could be out there in a sustainable way and they're pooping on the soil. And if it's managed properly, it can be sustainable. It just usually is not. Um, and then there are health concerns because uh, most of us are getting too much animal products in our diets. And, you know, 5% of the American population gets the recommended daily allowance for fiber, which is probably set too low. So we all need lots of fiber, a lot more than we're getting. And, um, and there are no, there's no fiber in any animal products. Uh, and fiber is not just good for keeping you regular, it's also what feeds the good bacteria in your gut. Um, so those are some concerns. Um, there are some nutrients that animal products can have that may be a benefit to some people. Um, I think that uh, I'm not one to say that no one should ever, under any circumstances, consume any animal products. I have too much respect for the diversity of ecosystems, values, ethics, uh, life experience, and nutritional realities on this planet to say that. I think you need to listen to your own body, but here's what we see. The blue zones are the places in the world where people live the longest, healthiest lives. Dan Buettner has documented them for National Geographic. There are six of them in Italy, in Greece, in Loma Linda, California, in Costa Rica, Okinawa, Japan, around the world. And the blue zones are all places where people eat very little animal products, between zero and five or ten percent. The average American gets 34 percent of our calories from animal products. So we could argue till the cows come home, literally, about whether the optimal amount of animal products in the human diet is zero or five or ten percent. What I don't think there's a lot of argument about is that it's a lot less than 34 percent. Thank you.